the Telegraph Money Podcast in association with Lion Trust, specialist fund managers. Hello, and welcome to It's Your Money, a brand new podcast looking at all the biggest financial questions. My name's Laura Souter, and coming up, we're going to be discussing all things from pensions to mortgages to chip and pin machines. But first, we're asking, are the markets about to crash? We all get scared when we hear talk of stock markets being at an all-time high. Credible people like hedge fund manager Crispin Odie have said the likelihood of a market crash is rising, while prominent investor Jim Rogers predicts a crash will happen in the next two years. Even Warren Buffett thinks there may be big falls ahead. To help us understand what's going on, I'm joined by Neil Brown, a fund manager at Lion Trust and expert on stock markets. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So how seriously should we be taking these quotes of market crashes? Absolutely. And you've got some uh, esteemed individuals there giving their opinions and we probably shouldn't um, you know, discount those. But I think personally, we, we see quite a few reasons to, to not think that a crash is going to happen imminently. Um, I would say valuation is still quite reasonable. I think underlying sentiment data is is picking up on a broad trend. We've had some pullbacks, but it's still very positive. And I think GDP growth, we've had upgrades from the IMF, is still really very supportive of that valuation level. And so many listeners out there will remember the tech boom and perhaps getting their fingers burnt a bit in that time. Are there comparisons that we can draw between some of the high valuations on companies in the stock market today and that kind of dot-com bubble? Yeah, and and I do sympathize with that view. You know, we have, particularly in the US uh, and the UK, we have gone through that. um, Well, we went through pre-crisis highs and then we went through um, 2000 highs, and I can understand that. But you need to really look at uh, valuation. Um, We look at sort of usual multiples, and actually things aren't particularly expensive. If you go back five years, where we currently are in the UK is only moderately above that five-year average. And it's nowhere near the peaks we saw uh, as recently as 2016. So we see headroom in terms of recent peaks, and we see us quite close to long run average. So we're pretty relaxed. Is it fair to say that it's harder to find those those pockets of value or those companies that are undervalued out there and have a lot more growth in them? Yeah, and this comes back to to having some sympathy with that uh, with that view that things are elevated. So they are elevated. We're above those long run averages, but we have compelling reasons to push on. The sort of stocks that are likely to to push on in that environment, it's not all of them. You have to be selective. Investors always have to be selective, but now more than ever, you need those companies that over the long term are going to continue to outperform their peers. We sort of try and avoid taking a view on next week or next month, but just over the long term, be really selective about those companies in good structural growth areas. So what can investors actually do? I mean, we've heard from from readers of the weekend money section saying that they're fearful of putting any more money into investments and some even saying that they feel like they should sell out and hold in cash in case a a crash does happen. So what practically can investors out there do? Well, for us, it's it's back to process. You know, you always come back to what we're trying to find and what we're trying to find um, as a team is to is deep long-term structural growth. You need to find those companies. And we look for, for trends that we think are structural, healthy eating, safer autos, energy efficiency. These trends will go on, um, we think, outperforming, regardless of, of perhaps a, a pullback, slightly weaker data. You know, it's, it's, again, just focus on those long-term themes. And is, there, is it fair to say that we should be looking over a long time period than maybe the six, next six months of a market crash? Yeah, it, it certainly, certainly fits with our process. We think you have to, um, you know, I, fair play to those who attempt to pay quarterly earnings. There'll be plenty uh, attempting that over the next few weeks. But our process is very much to, to look out three to five years, which company is going to do better? Do you want to be in a company that's producing goods that we, even if we may like them, are fundamentally struggled, uh, struggling? We see that in the retail space. We might see that with less healthy um, products. Or do you want those, com- those products and companies that are really tapping into the big trends in our economies and getting growth well ahead of their peers because of that? And when we're talking about those readers that are saying that they might go to cash or they might stop putting money in, is there a risk that they're trying to time that market, which even professional fund managers such as yourself find very hard to to predict exactly when markets are going to go up and down? 
It is. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I think, you know, we started this by saying, is a crash imminent? And although I don't believe there is, you know, is there a chance of small pullbacks? Is a small pullback um, just the proper functioning of a market? You know, you can't keep hitting all time highs. That's how you get into boom and bust. So is some moderation to be expected? Yes. Do companies have difficult quarterly earnings? Yes, they do. So we really try and look through that. Um, and I, I wouldn't try to play those short-term moves. I think they're very difficult. Um, so that's really, you know, the only view I can give is we come at a, at a three to five year view, which in itself is very difficult. Um, but we think you have a better chance there of outperforming. And so I guess the big elephant in the room is also Brexit. What's the impact of that going to be on UK markets? Still too early uh, to tell. I know that's hard to believe, but it is still too early to tell. But I think, um, and I take a sort of pan-European approach to this, but when I look across European markets, when I looked at the beginning of the year, the big risks across Europe uh, were political. You know, the UK had uh, been through its issues, so we thought, with the referendum last year. The US had had its election, and we were very focused on uh, the Dutch elections, the French elections, the German elections, and even Italy looked likely at the beginning of the year. Uh, What we have now is they have all de-risked. Regardless of your views uh, on the individuals, the result in the Netherlands was good for markets. The result in France has been good for markets. We have reform now. And Germany, a lot of the heat has come out. It looks like Merkel will win that. Renzi has also pulled away from an Italian uh, election. Meanwhile, in the UK, we have not de-risked politically. Quite the opposite. We now have a situation... Uh, where there is still very much work in progress for a, from a government perspective. And I think that's holding back. That's holding back consumers spending. That's holding back private individuals investing. And that's probably even holding back corporate investment, which is it's just difficult over the long term for wage growth and for new opportunities there. And how do the UK market valuations compare with the rest of the world? I mean, you touched on Europe a bit there, but how about areas like the US and like emerging markets? Are they looking very costly compared to those or actually more fairly valued? And this is a a big part of why I am positive on the UK and Europe. You know, if you look at our valuation, you obviously look against history where we're just above averages, as I've said, but you also look at where else could people put their money. Um, And the US is at all time highs, both in terms of share price and in valuation. UK is a little further on and Europe's behind that. So, you know, in terms of where would you put your money on a valuation basis, we look good in our region. And then you look at our trading partners and, you know, the IMF in April um, upgraded uh, global growth. We're at three and a half percent. China's looking very strong in there at six and a half percent. And as a part of that, they've increased um, likely UK GDP growth to uh, maybe as much as two percent. So back to trend growth. These are the people we trade with and the global economy, you know, does look pretty stable. Neil, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you very much. Moving on to the question that's gripping homeowners' minds, when will mortgage rates rise? And if they do, what does it mean for house prices? Joining me today on the phone to look at mortgage rates is David Hollingworth from Mortgage Brokers LNC. And here in the studio to talk about the effect any rate rises will have on the housing market is Lucian Cook, Director of Residential Research at Savills. So, David, let's come to you first. Is time running out to lock in rock-bottom low mortgage rates? Well, certainly mortgage rates are as low as we've really ever seen. Um, They they seem to be just getting lower and lower. So the question for borrowers is, what are they waiting for? You know, I mean, sometimes we think everyone should be reviewing their rate, everyone should be locking into these deals, but so many aren't doing anything, and you begin to wonder what they are waiting for. And of course, now the talk is turning to when might a base rate rise come? Um, The split decision last month, but of course, reducing inflation uh, just this week. So the question is still out as to when base rate might rise. But I can't see mortgage rates being able to get much lower than they currently are. So I, I think now's the time if you haven't done anything about your mortgage, you potentially just throw money down the drain. And is that particularly the case for those that have moved on to variable rates and have come off their fixed rate? Well, to give some context, uh, an average standard variable rate may be around 4.5%. Some are a bit lower, some are quite a bit higher. Um, But considering we've seen lenders, uh, another lender, Skipton, joining the sub-1% group on the two-year fixed rate, it gives you some kind of sense of the savings that could be on offer. And even if you want to lock in for the medium term, so those who are anxious about the potential for rate rises 
to come in the future, then you can easily be undercutting 2% on a five-year fixed rate. And let's just bring Lucian in here. So thousands of first-time buyers have never experienced a, an interest rate rise and, and higher rates on their mortgages. And then there's a whole generation that have likely never paid more than 5%. So what's going to be the impact on house prices if we do see an interest rate rise, whether that's marginal or meaningful? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the expectation is that when rates do go up, they're likely to go up quite slowly. They're not going to get back to the sort of norms that we saw um, pre-credit crunch. And so that means that they're likely had a, to have a, a limited, sort of put limited pressure, downward pressure on house prices. I think what's much more likely is that they are firstly, the first rate rise is symbolic. It just is a wake up call for first time buyers and indeed for second steppers um, that rates can go up as, as well as go down. What will definitely happen, though, is when they go to get that mortgage and their affordability is stress tested, which needs to be done because of mortgage regulation, they will just then find a cap on the amount that they're able to borrow. Uh, And that, I suspect, will act as a drag on house price growth rather than anything else. Does that then have implications for people that are looking to remortgage as well if those affordability tests do get stricter? Yeah, well, uh, technically, uh, as I understand it, and and David will will come in, um, when you're looking to remortgage, uh, you don't necessarily have to apply with the same uh, mortgage regulation. Um, I suspect the area where it, it may have a greater impact is in the buy-to-let market. We've seen in that market that there's a, a limit on the tax relief you can get on those interest payments. So if you like, an increase in interest rates is uh, having a, 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 a leveraged effect in that you know, the, the interest rate rises is compounded by the fact that you're getting progressively uh, less, uh, less tax relief. And again, I think that will impact on the ability of buy-to-let investors to extend their portfolios. Uh, and already we've seen um, we've already seen uh, much lower levels of buy-to-let lending uh, in the recent past with the 3% stamp duty than we would have seen a year ago, those levels down by about half. David, is that something that you guys have seen your end? So buy-to-let's been under a lot of pressure, so stamp duty as well, um, just over a year ago now, came in with a surcharge. But as Lucien said, the tax relief changes are starting to bite now, um, and portfolio landlords will also have some additional rule changes in all likelihood from lenders coming in from September. So there's a lot going on in buy-to-let, all of which could potentially put some uh, landlords off uh, and transaction numbers are down. Um, I think a rate rise will, of course, spark remortgage activity because those who have not got round to doing anything uh, will will suddenly be kick-started into action and they'll suddenly review their deal. Um, and actually what they may find is that rates have moved on a little bit. So the, the record lows that are currently around may have just edged up a bit already by that point. And what about kind of at the other end of the spectrum here? What about first time buyers, those that are currently saving for their deposits and have maybe got close to being able to buy? Is talk of kind of mortgage rate rises and potential house price growth slowing is that a reason for them to hold off or is it still better for them to uh, buy as soon as they can afford to well i think the biggest uh, the biggest barrier for first time buyers is as you say getting that deposit um so it's very much about the time that they take to accumulate the deposit whether or not they've got access to the bank of mum and dad which we know has been an increasingly um, important source of funding um, for first-time buyers, and then whether they find the property that is that is right for them. Now, clearly, it's much easier for them to get on the housing ladder when rates are low, um, or, and certainly as low as they are now. But uh, still, the overriding constraint is the ability to accumulate that deposit. And so for them, savings are critically important, and indeed, the savings and the cash which their parents have at their disposal. And does it also matter what area of the country they're buying in? I mean, we've heard previously anecdotally that, that any slowdown in house prices, and I, and I think we're seeing this already in the figures, will impact London and the South East, which have historically seen larger gains. So is there a difference with first-time buyers there? Yeah, I mean, absolutely no doubt. If you, if you look at the average deposit of a first-time buyer um, in London, um, it's in excess of £90,000. Um, and if you look at multiples, the amount that they're borrowing relative to their income, it's much higher because of that house price growth. And of course, that means that an interest rate rise um, in those markets has a greater impact. It limits the market more. It limits where they're able to buy or whether they're able to buy in London. And David, um, is that something that you guys are seeing? Well, I think the way that mortgage regulation is trying to approach things from an affordability perspective It's inevitable that if prices continue to grow 
um, at a faster rate than than people can keep up in deposit accumulation and in wage growth, then they're going to fall away from the market. So that may be where we start to see prices just plateauing off a little bit as um, more and more buyers would, would fall out of the, the market altogether otherwise. Um, but first-time buyer numbers have been strong, um, and there's certainly demand there. It's just about where that supply for first-time buyers is coming from at the moment. They've perhaps benefited a little bit from that reduction in buy-to-let transactions as well. So it's not all doom and gloom, but the, the focus will be on getting a big deposit together, using things like the help to buy and lifetime ISA options to boost that, um, get the deposit together, but primarily looking for something that's going to suit them as a, as a home going forward, rather than worrying too much about whether prices are on the up or just um, starting to shelve a little bit in their area. So we've talked about first-time buyers. So what about those that are taking the second step and, and buying their second property? Yeah. So as we've heard David say, actually, first-time buyer numbers have been have been pretty robust, much more robust than we would have expected, given the barriers to getting on the housing ladder. The people who've really been clobbered have been the second steppers and those trying to trade up the housing market. And it just looks like people are living in their home for much longer. For a lot of those people, of course, they haven't seen the house price growth to enable them to trade up the housing ladder um, to get the next mortgage. And, you know, an interest rate rise will affect those guys just as much as it will first time buyers in other parts of the market. And David, are you seeing any wariness from those people and kind of a slowdown in terms of your customers that are coming from that from that segment of the market? There's some uncertainty, which may prevent some people taking that next and, and big move. As Lucian said, it's not an easy step to take. Others may be using things like help to buy and the equity loan. So they may try and push for a bigger home to try and avoid having to take another step in the middle. So using the equity loan to increase the size of property that they're able to buy. Um, but certainly affordability is not an, an issue that only affects first-time buyers. And still those big deposit requirements can be a struggle for those making the second step up. Lucy and David, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Still to come on It's Your Money, we're talking about that frustrating moment when you just can't remember your PIN. Before that, though, the pension tax trap. With recent pension reforms intended to give those over the age of 55 greater freedom by accessing their pension cash early, many have instead found themselves with a tax headache by taking small payments or lump sums from their pensions. There are two scenarios that can land you with an unnecessarily large bill from HMRC. Here to explain the traps and how to avoid falling into them, is Telegraph Money Editor Richard Dyson. So Richard, talk us through the first of these tax trap problems. Well, we're beginning to see from readers that quite a few people are slipping up in a number of ways uh, regarding tax and they're paying too much. The first trap is where you make that first withdrawal out of your pension under these new rules. And most people are taking a lump sum. So say they take £5,000 as their first withdrawal from the pension. When their provider, their pension provider, contacts the tax man, a tax code is, is generated for them. But, and this is the problem, HMRC generates a tax code on the assumption that that £5,000 is going to be taken every month. And so the tax code that comes out is far too high and results in too much money being paid to the tax man. That in itself is a problem that can be sorted out over time, but the saver would have to claim that back, so it's a bit of a fiddle. So they end up with less money from that, for example, the £5,000 than they originally intended, and with a large tax bill. So how can they fix that? Is there an easy way? It, it may well be that they didn't have to pay any tax at all. So, so there could be a huge amount of overtaxation going on. Uh, if that's happened, there is a bit of a cumbersome process involved in getting the tax back, although HMRC promises that it'll help make that as easy as possible. But the, the thing to do is try and avoid that trap. So if you're making your first withdrawal, you can do what uh, some people have called the one pound trick, which is to make your first withdrawal quite small. Uh, you may not be able to take as little as one pound, depends on your provider, but if you say take 500 pounds when you ultimately intend to take 10,000, then that first withdrawal will again generate a tax code, but it will be a much more modest tax code. So at the end of the process, there may still be a tax adjustment needed, but at least you won't be hugely overtaxed. Uh, on that first withdrawal. So with taking that small withdrawal initially, do uh, those using pension freedoms have to be conscious that they might end up with a tax bill at the end of it rather than uh, getting tax paid back? No, I don't think that should happen. Um, all, that, all that will happen is that a tax code 
that they may still not have to pay any tax whatsoever. There is going to be an adjustment process based on how much income from a variety of sources they have uh, taken during the course of that year. But all that they're preventing happening is a very excessive tax code being generated in the first instance. So that's the first one. What's the second pitfall that these people can make? The second pitfall really is about tax planning. As you know, there are a number of tax uh, rates depending on how much you earn within a year's period. And what people need to be careful of, and, and some people are slipping up over this, is if they take too much income in one go, or too much cash in one go out of their pension, they might push their income for that tax year into a higher bracket. So everyone can earn, at the moment, in this tax year, up to £11,500 without paying any tax. Now, if you, say, have a bit of state pension and you want to take uh, a lump sum of £6,000 out, out of your pension, you might avoid tax by, for example, taking some of that in one tax year, and the tax year ends on the 5th of April, and then taking some in the next. And that way, you might stop pushing your income for one tax year into the higher bracket, and you can avoid paying unnecessary tax. So it's really about planning out beyond this current tax year and looking at how much you want to take from your pension and the best way and most exactly. efficient way. Exactly. Tax trap number two is about estimating how much income you've got in any one tax year and then planning your pension withdrawals around that so as not to pay a higher rate of tax than necessary. Thanks very much for joining us. Finally, you're at the checkout, ready to pay for your shopping, and your mind goes blank. What is my PIN? In a recent Telegraph Money poll, we found that almost half of respondents were using their PIN less as contactless card use rises, while 30% of people admitted that they've forgotten their PIN in the past few years. To look at this question is Martin James at Consumer Champion Resolver. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Laura. So first, do we have too many pins and passwords to remember? And should we panic when we have this temporary pin black hole? So I'm going to say yes and no. Yes, we do have too many passwords. Um, I'm dyslexic. I really struggle to remember them as well. Should we panic? No. There are a couple of things that we can do to kind of make life easy for ourselves. But the whole issue with, with pins... It's really, really difficult for uh, for people. And I've seen some crazy examples over the years. We had um, one lady who I met when I was out and about uh, with um, a, a colleague from Northern Ireland who uh, quite proudly showed me her cards that she'd written the pin number on the back of. And then we had to explain to her why that was a bad idea. Um, and then there was another gentleman as well, this is genuinely true, who um, phoned when I was working for a big bank. And he wanted me to um, complain. Uh, he wanted to complain to me about... Uh, the fact that the bank had painted the front of the building. And when we asked why, it was because he'd written his PIN number on the wall by the ATM machine, and now he couldn't remember it. So there are lots, I mean, there are loads of comedy stories, and people really do some quite silly things. But ultimately, um, this, it is something that really does worry people a great deal, and quite rightly, because it's your access to money with high street branches closing across the land. This is increasingly going to become an issue for people. And so what can people do to try and remember their PIN? You've got so many online logins these days. You've got different PIN numbers for each card. And we're always warned against using the same one for each card because that puts us at risk of fraud. So what can people do? Is it a case of not using contactless so they use their PIN more often? Or are there other tricks to remember it? Well, I'm going to be a bit controversial here and disagree with um, the banks because I don't think there's a big problem with using the same PIN number across a couple of bank accounts. The problem is, though, people tend to use that four-digit PIN number for things like their um, online shopping accounts as well. So as long as you use the same one and don't disclose it for your banking, it will be hard for the bank to argue that you are enabling a fraud to happen. I have seen some that have tried it, and they've been given pretty short shrift at the end of the day. Um, obviously, the key things are not to go for guessable numbers. What I find quite useful is uh, most people can usually remember um, a telephone number of a friend or a relative. Even me, I'm terrible with numbers. I can barely remember my own. But um, the last four digits of that special number to someone, try not to make it your mum's or your daughter's or, or whatever. But um, that's a very good way to kind of keep an, a different set of numbers um, in your mind. Passwords on computers are also tricky as well because they do need to be secure. Um, but a good way that you can remember uh, an unusual password is to say, um, think of a song that you really like and take the first letter of every single word in that song in the chorus. And soon you'll have a longer password. It'll be made up of all kinds of different um, letters, uh, but you'll always have a way of remembering it in case of an emergency. 
And we touched on it in the start with our poll of Telegraph readers who are using contactless cards more. But um, I know from our previous conversations that you said that there's been a bit of a backlash against contactless card use. And some people don't actually want these cards thrust upon them. Well, absolutely. Yes. At Resolver, we're starting to see complaints through from people who um, are saying that they just don't want the contactless element. They're worried about money being taken as they walk past a cash point. And I think the industry has a lot more to do to reassure people about the security of contactless cards. Um, for, my, for my generation, um, it's we have a problem with complacency because I'll be the first person to uh, to come on and talk on the podcast about doing these things and then slap my card um, against a reader in a bar without properly checking it. So we need to remember to ask for receipts. We need to remember to look what that balance is because if you don't check these things, then your rights go, kind of go out the window sometimes. But contactlessness, your people are right to be con- concerned about it because it's also a great way for banks and other organisations to collect data on you, how you live and what you're up to. Um, and that has some privacy issues as well. So I think we need to all be aware of this and maybe in the future we'll have some stronger rules about what can be done with that information. It's definitely going to be interesting to see. Thanks a lot for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. That's all we've got time for this week. You've been listening to It's Your Money. Thank you to all my guests for their expert knowledge. You can get in touch with us throughout the week and ask any questions you have via Twitter. Go to at Money Telegraph or you can email us at money at telegraph.co.uk. And remember, subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. The Telegraph Money Podcast in association with Lion Trust. Specialist investors helping you reach your financial goals. Remember, investments can fall as well as rise.